Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question the narrative video. And in today's video, I'm going to explore the little people of North America. Little people, or what we might sometimes call elves or gnomes or leprechauns or fairies, those stories are just as abundant in North American, Native American legends as they are in those more popular versions that we usually hear. You know, we'll often hear stories about the Celtic leprechauns or the Icelandic elves or the, the gnomes of Norway. But we don't really hear very much about these Native American legends. And I thought it would be fun to go through them today because they are just as rich as the tales that we hear from other, from other parts of the world. And speaking of other parts of the world, this is another thing that I find to be very interesting. Little people or some sorts of little creatures, those stories are just as abundant worldwide as many of the other things that I talk about on this channel. I know that I focus a lot on the giants, but their tiny counterpart, the little, the little people, from what I understand, those stories are even more abundant than what we hear about the giants. And yes, there are tales of giants worldwide. And I mention it all the time that there are so many similar tales that get told around the world. There has to be something to them. Even stories of Sasquatch type creatures. You hear from of them all around. There is the Yaren of China. The, I believe it's called Almasty in, in Russia. There is the Yowie in Australia. Of course, there's the Abominable Snowman in Tibet, and he's probably one of the most popular. There is Bigfoot in North America. There is Sasquatch in Canada. So just as with the little people, yeah, these, these creatures are also to be found everywhere. And that, that goes to say also with the flood, there are so many stories of flood from, from worldwide. And so like I mentioned before, with all of those other topics, when you have all of these seemingly unrelated cultures talking about the, sa the same sorts of things, you have to start thinking, all right, well, maybe there's something to this. Now, before I actually get right to talking about some of these creatures, I think it's also important that we at least try to theorize where these creatures may be coming from. And, you know, you might have different ideas than I do, and these are, they're all valid because we don't really know for sure. But one of the ideas that I have about, if not all of these little creatures, at least some of them, is that they may be a part of the Nephilim bloodline. And the, the Nephilim bloodline can also be called the Elven bloodline. And at least according to Gary Wayne, the, the Nephilim or the Elven bloodline, they could change form. They could change size. So does that account for some of these smaller creatures that are seen? And could that even account for why so many of them seem to be malevolent just as the Nephilim seem to be? Along the same lines as the Nephilim, I've often thought that these little little people, little creatures, whatever you want to call them, they may also be some sort of other hybrid creature. And we know that the the Nephilim, they they it says they sinned against man, they sinned against the animals. We don't know what sort of experimentation that they did, but it is also possible that some of this crossbreeding could have occurred between other creatures that could have produced these little people. Just as in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the White Witch was said to be have not a drop of human blood in her, and she was said to come from Lilith, who was a djinn and a giant. Could some of these creatures have come from not, you know, a watcher and a, a human woman as the Nephilim that we tend to think of did, but could they have come from something else that is similar to that, but not exactly the Nephilim, your typical Nephilim that I talk about here. I've also wondered if, if not all, at least some of them could possibly be some sort of creation from another dimension, another world. And I know that a lot of Christians don't like when I talk about that, but just as we don't have the whole story of the Elohim, 
We don't have their whole creation story. We don't have their whole history. Why? Well, because that's not our story. The Bible was given to us because the Bible is our story. That does not, however, mean that the Elohim do not have their own story. And in fact, are there other creation besides the Elohim? Or could these small creatures be a part of the Elohim? It's something that we often don't like to think about because we like to think that we are all there is. But just the mere fact that the Elohim exists shows us that God did create other um, sentient beings. And so, yeah, I think it's very possible that that they may have just been another parallel creature that may have been created by God. And just because we don't have all of the information about them doesn't mean that they don't exist. In fact, you know, thinking about this idea makes me think of the, the tale that I told in a few videos back from the Steve Quayle Little Creatures book when he, he told an account of someone who saw these little people um, coming up from a valley. I believe it was in either Scotland or Ireland. And when the boy said to him, hey, hey, man, wh where are you going? And the man turned around and looked at him and he said, I am not I am not a son of Adam. And they were also little people. So if these creatures come from an alternate dimension or from maybe even just underground, you know, they're often said to be living underground. And many of these mounds and everything that are found all over the world said to have tunnels underground. We know there are tunnels underground everywhere. And so could they be coming from there? And if they are not from Adam, of course, they're not going to be sons of Adam, but something else entirely. Another idea is that they could be what some people may call elementals. And I know, again, a lot of people don't like to talk about elementals. They think that they are new age, but they are written about in the book of Enoch, which is not canon. However, we can still look at it for information because it, it is quoted in the Bible. And so are some of these creatures that we see elementals? And so let's actually take a look at the book of Enoch and see what it says about them. Then another angel who proceeded with me spoke to me and showed me the first and last secrets in heaven above and in the depths of the earth. In the extremities of heaven and in the foundations of it and in the receptacle of the winds, he showed me how their spirits were divided, how they were balanced, and how both the springs and the winds were numbered according to the force of their spirit. He showed me the power of the moon's light, that its power is a just one, as well as the divisions of the stars, according to their respective names, that every division is divided, that the lightning flashes that its troops immediately obey, and that a cessation takes place during thunder in continuance of its sound. Nor are the thunder and the lightning separated, neither do both of them move with one spirit, yet are they not separated. For when the lightning lightens, the thunder sounds, and the spirit at a proper period pauses, making an equal division between them, for the receptacle, the receptacle upon which their periods depend is loose as sand. Each of them, at a proper season, is restrained with a bridle and turned by the power of the Spirit, which thus propels them according to the spacious extent of the earth. The Spirit, likewise, of the sea, I hope you're seeing this, uh, this pattern here, Spirit, 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 Spirit. The Spirit, likewise, of the sea is potent and strong, and as a strong power causes it to ebb, so is it driven forwards and scattered against the mountains of the earth. The spirit of the frost has its angel. In the spirit of hail, there is a good angel. The spirit of snow ceases in its strength, and a solitary spirit is in it, which ascends from it like vapor and is called refrigeration. The spirit also of mist dwells with them in their receptacle, but it has a receptacle to itself, for its progress is in splendor. In light and in darkness, in winter and in summer, its receptacle is bright and an angel is in it. The spirit of dew has its abode in the extremities of heaven in connection with the receptacle of rain and its progress is in winter and in summer. The cloud produced by it and the cloud of the mist become united, 
one gives to the other, and when the spirit of rain is in motion from its receptacle, angels come, and opening its receptacle, bring it forth. When likewise it is sprinkled over all the earth, it forms a union with every kind of water on the ground, for the waters remain on the ground, because they afford nourishment to the earth from the Most High, who is in heaven. Upon this account, therefore, there is a regulation in the quantity of rain which the angels receive. These things I saw, all of them, even paradise. So are some of these smaller creatures that we see maybe some of these spirits that are spoken of here in the book of Enoch? Whatever they are, um, let's get started on learning some of the little people of North America. And yeah, I am going to start in Wikipedia. I have some other articles that we're going to read, but I actually found an interesting account in here, so I thought that I would share it. The native peoples of North America told legends of a race of little people who lived in the woods near sandy hills and sometimes near rocks located along large bodies of water, such as the Great Lakes. Often described as hairy-faced dwarfs in stories, petroglyph illustrations show them with horns on their head and traveling in a group of five to seven per canoe. Native legends often talk of the little people playing pranks on people, such as singing and then hiding when an inquisitive person searches for the music. I'm going to stop right there and say that reminds me very much of what we hear about the, the elves of Europe and also of some of the little people that there are tales of in Africa. It is often said that the little people love children and would take them away from bad or abusive parents or if the child was without parents and left in the woods to fend for themselves. Other legends say the little people, if seen by an adult human, would beg them not to say anything of their existence and would reward those who kept their word by helping them and their family out in times of need. From tribe to tribe, there are variations of what the little people's mannerisms were like and whether they were good or evil may be different. One of the common beliefs is that the little people create distractions to cause mischief. They were believed to be gods by some. One North American native tribe believed that they lived in nearby caves. The caves were never entered for fear of disturbing the little people. And again, that is also something that is very common with what you hear of the European legends of the little people, that they are to be found in caves or somewhere that will take them underground. Legends of physical remains of tiny people being found in various locations in the western United States, particularly Montana and Wyoming, typically describe the remains as being found in caves with various details, such as descriptions that they were perfectly formed, dwarf size, etc. Often as an effort to enhance credibility, archaeologist Lawrence L. Lowendorf notes that some tales make claims that the burials, of course, are always sent to a local university or to the Smithsonian <laughs> for analysis, only to have both the specimens and research results disappear. Does that sound familiar? That sure sounds like what happens to all of the remains of the giants that are found too that are sent to the Smithsonian. They all disappear as well. So it appears that it happens to these. Anyway, Lowendorf also suggests that the discovery of two mummies of an anencephalic infants in the first half of the 20th century with deformities that caused some people to believe they were adults has contributed to public belief in the existence of a group of tiny prehistoric people. Lewis and Clark reported in their journals that Native Americans in the vicinity of Spirit Mound, South Dakota, held a belief in little people who inhabited the mound. And again, so now we have mounds and we know that there are mound builders, you know, and there are mounds in Ohio. I don't know if they're related. The mounds in Ohio are, are typically um, at least said to be uh related to the, the giants. However, there are also mounds, fairy mounds over in Europe. Clark wrote that the local Native Americans could not be persuaded to approach the mound as they feared these tiny devils and considered them to be dangerous. Although members of Lewis and Clark's party visited the mound, they did not encounter any unusual beings. A graveyard unearthed in the 1830s in Conshocton County, Ohio, was believed to contain skeletons belonging to a pygmy race. In fact, the graves, which were roughly three feet 
long were bone burials containing disarticulated or bent bones packed together. So the idea of these, of some of these creatures, at least, it, it also reminds me of Lord of the Rings because you have the, the elves, which to me remind me of the, the fallen angels or the watchers or just angels in general. And then you have the orcs who are to me would be like the Nephilim, but then you have the hobbits and these are a, a smaller type of humanoid creature. And so I think that it's possible that Tolkien may have been drawing on some of this folklore. We call it folklore, but is it actually history? So as you can see, there are many different types of little people in Native American legend, and we're just going to go over some of them. And I've noticed that a lot of them, it's very hard to find any information on them. You might only find maybe two or three sentences, and that's it. So that's why we're not going to go over all of them. But uh, let me see. I think that we're going to do this one first. So this this one is actually in Mexico, and this is called the Alush. There are many cultures around the world that have myths of magical little people who live their lives outside of the view of normal humans. Gnomes, leprechauns, elves, fairies, and pixies are some of the European manifestations of this phenomenon. In Mexico, we also see a tradition of powerful, nearly invisible, small statured human-like creatures in two areas. So, and just like it says they are nearly invisible, the, the creatures that are in Europe too, and also Africa, I know this, of the creatures in Africa just from watching Destination Truth, but they are also, they're pretty much invisible. They are, they are very, very hard to find. We see what is called the Alush, or plural, I'm not even going to try to say that, in the Maya heartland, encompassing the Yucatan Peninsula and modern-day Mexican states of Chiapas and Tabasco. In the eastern and southern portions of the former Aztec Empire, notably in the present-day states of Veracruz, Oaxaca, and Guerrero, the we folk were called Chanekes. The word Taneke comes from the Nahuatl word meaning those who inhabit dangerous places. So we see the magical little people legends confined to the eastern and southern parts of the modern day nation of Mexico. To this day, people believe in these creatures and the Alush Taneke phenomenon has been studied by serious Mexican and international researchers. The concept of the Alush or Chaneke in Mexico may date back thousands of years. The Olmec culture, considered the mother civilization of ancient Mexico, flourished in the area of the Gulf Coast from around 1600 BC to 300 BC. Although the Olmecs had no written record, they left behind much in the form of sculpture, pottery, and monumental architecture. Among the artifacts of this civilization, we see depictions of dwarf-like humans engaging in service to the elites or as court entertainers, much like P.T. Barnum's tiny Mexican duo. Some investigators believe these cultural remnants illustrate actual human dwarfs who held special status in Olmec society. So I'm going to leave a link. Actually, no, this actually looks pretty interesting. Let's go down here. So if people believe in these creatures and have actually seen them in some cases, what do they look like? They are generally described as fully human, but in smaller form, sometimes standing no more than two feet tall and sometimes clothed. They tend to have larger eyes, which are sometimes described as a glowing red, and their noses are larger than a normal human's. Their ears are pointed, much like those of European elves. Often they are said to wear straw hats and cloth shoes, and they carry bags made of cloth or agave cactus fiber. Their bag of tricks, so to speak. In some legends, the Alush or Chineke carry around slingshots to use in hunting or to shoot stones at disagreeable humans. Other stories of this creature give it a less friendly and more diabolical appearance. In some recent sightings in Mexico, the creature has been depicted as a hairless, almost alien-looking humanoid with a large forehead, big black eyes, and claws on its feet and hands. In some legends, the creature is said to have backwards-facing feet and is covered in fur, much like the Mexican jungle-dwelling version of Bigfoot called the Sisamite. Please 
see Mexico Unexplained, episode number 12. Well, no thank you, but we'll just read right here. According to some accounts, these creatures have been known to shapeshift from their diminutive human-like form into the form of animals found in their domains. And so the shape-shifting, actually, that, that goes right along with what Gary Wayne does say about the Nephilim have the ability to shapeshift. So let's just check another one out now. Nemerigar, mythological race of little people living in Wyoming. Native Americans of the Sioux, Cheyenne, Crow, and Arapaho have a rich oral tradition of a race of tiny people commonly known as little people. The tradition of little people was widely known among the native people long before the European settlers came to North America. Also, Comanche stories of the so-called Nunupis, Hawaii, have the Menehune, and stories of Cherokee people mention the Yamwe. And I did do a video on some of the on some other small creatures from around the world, and the Menehune were one of them. So I'll link that um, at the end of this video. According to stories, these little people are tiny creatures about 20 inches to 3 feet tall. Some native tribes called them tiny people eaters, while others believed they were healers or probably spirits or mythological creatures similar to fairies and leprechauns. So the idea that these creatures were healers is also very interesting because another term for the Nephilim, especially after the flood, is the Rephaim. And the root word for Rephaim means healer. So I, I think that that's very interesting, too, if you consider that they may be related to the Nephilim. The little people tradition was widely known among the native people long before the European settlers came to North America. According to the Shoshone Indians of Wyoming that share boundaries with such states as Montana, South Dakota, Nebraska, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho, these little people, known as the Nemerigar, were said to have lived in the Wind River and Pedro Ranges of Wyoming. Not human-friendly, but rather aggressive, the Nemerigar used to shoot poisoned arrows from tiny bows. Stories about the little people have been long regarded as human fantasies until certain discoveries began to suggest the contrary. In 1932, a curious tiny mummy about six and a half inches tall in its seated position and estimated at 14 inches tall in the standing position was found when Cecil Maine and Frank Carr were digging for gold in the San Pedro Mountains about 60 miles southwest of Casper, Wyoming. The ancient body, small size and features, later dubbed the Pedro Mountains Mummy, indicated it could once have been a member of the hidden race of the little people living in America. Interestingly, in the book of William J. Bomber, Centennial History of Conshocton County, we learned that missionary David Zeisberger suggested in 1778 the possible existence of Nemerigar or other little peepers, peoples, peepers, yeah, okay, peoples in North America near Conshocton, Ohio. Zeisberger believed that a particular burial ground contained several remains of a pygmy race, about three feet in height. The long rows of graves of the pygmy race at Kashokton were regularly arranged with heads to the west, a circumstance which has given rise to the theory that these people were sun worshippers, facing the daily approach of the sun god over the eastern hills. Acceptance of the sun worship surmise does not necessarily imply a deduction that this pygmy race may have descended from the river people of Hindostan or Egypt. Prehistoric man, wherever found, seems to have been a sun worshiper. There's going to be a lot of that going on on Monday. Anyway, archaeological evidence of the Nemerigar creatures needs to be included. As long as we cannot find and examine the skeletons of this tiny race of beings, these creatures remain a mystery. So that is the Nemerigar, yet another type of little people that are told of from the Native Americans right here in North America. Next, we have the Pukwudgie. So it says, the term also spelled Pukwudgie originated in the Wampanoag tribe in the United States, according to the Encyclopedia of Fairies in World Folklore and Mythologies. They are small troll-like creatures 
able to appear and disappear at will and shape shift into animals. Another thing that I find interesting is that just as the European little people seem to have so many different descriptions, meaning I'm thinking different types of species of them, the same thing is going on in North America as well. I, I don't think that it's one uniform type of little creature. I think that there are different types of them. And so they could all have different origins. They can also influence people's minds and create fire and poison arrows. Sounds very similar, at least this part, to the last ones that we just read about. The Pukwudgies supposedly look like large-faced elves, standing no more than three feet tall with enlarged ears, fingers, and noses. So the enlarged noses, that sounds the same as the Alouche, too. The Encyclopedia of Fairies says their skin is gray and smooth. According to the lineup, legend has it that Pukwudgies lived in harmony with humans, but when the Wampanoag devoted all their attention to Mousetop, a land deity that created Cape Cod, Pukwudgies became jealous and mischievous, so Mousetop exiled them. As revenge, the Pukwudgies killed either Mousetop or his sons. Um, in Wampanoag legend, Pukwudgies were a lot like leprechauns. They could trick someone, steal a child, or lure people deep into the woods or off of cliffs. It's even rumored Pukwudgies could possess the spirits of long-dead ancestors. Most sightings of these creepy beings occur around New England. Police in the city of Freetown, Massachusetts went so far as to put up signs warning of Pukwudgie crossings. That actually reminds me of in Iceland when they actually will, they, they did away with a bridge project because it was thought that there were elves there. So here we've got the Pukwudgies, and they're said to be very much like leprechauns. So again, I think that many of the tales that we hear from around the world, they're, they're, they're not just confined to that one country. I think that you will find different creatures of the same species, but dispersed throughout the world. At least that's what it certainly sounds like. And now we have, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, the Yunwe Sunsti, Cherokee Little Folk. In addition to the Nunahi, who are powerful supernatural warriors, there is another group of fairy beings in Cherokee folklore. And I will say, I did look up the Nunahi or Nunahai, and they are not little creatures. It says that they look just like the other Native Americans, which is why I did not include them in case you're curious. But it says there is another group of fairy beings in Cherokee folklore. These are the Yunwi Sunsdi or little people. Like the Nunahi, the Yunwi Sunsdi prefer to be invisible. Sounds like a lot of the other little creatures. Although they do sometimes appear to humans as miniature people, child-sized or smaller. Again, sounds very similar to the European counterparts. They are well-proportioned and handsome with hair that reaches almost to the ground. It is said that twins are especially adept at seeing these tiny creatures. Yunwi Sunsti are depicted as helpful, kind, and magically adept. Like many fairy creatures, they love music and spend much of their time singing, drumming, and dancing. For all this, they have a very gentle nature and do not like to be disturbed. Even so, they are said to harshly punish those who are disrespectful or aggressive toward them. In Cherokee lore, the Yunwe Sunsti are divided into three clans. The Rock Clan is the most malicious, quick to get even when offended. Some say they are like this because their space has been invaded. Like many types of European fae, they are known to steal human children. The Laurel Clan is generally benevolent, humorous, and joyful. They are also mischievous, however, and love to play tricks on the unsuspecting. The Dogwood Clan is the most favorably disposed to humans, though they are also stern, serious, and prefer to be left alone. Each of these clans, it is said, teaches a moral lesson. The Rock Clan teaches not to mistreat others, lest m misfortune come back against us in return. It is important to respect the limits and boundaries of others. The lesson of the Laurel clan is not to take the world too seriously. People must always have joy and share that joy with others. Finally, the Dogwood clan's lesson is to treat others kindly out of the goodness of one's heart and not in hope of reward. Those all sound very nice to me. 
Uh, Yunwi Sunsti are perhaps the most common type of fairy being in the American Southeast. Legends about the Choctaw Hatak Awasa and the Muskogee Este Lapoke, both also meaning little people, are quite similar to what the Cherokees say of the Yunwi Sunsti, so possibly the same thing. The Catawba know of creatures that are essentially identical, which they call Yehasori, not human ones. It's very interesting. It kind of reminds me of not a son of Adam, not human ones. And, and yeah, so it certainly sounds like these different tribes are encountering the same types of creatures. And lastly, I would just like to share with you the little people of the prior mountains. Crow folklore says the little people live in the Pryor Mountains, a small mountain range in Carbon County, Montana, and Bighorn County, Montana. Petroglyphs on rocks in the mountains, the crow said, were made by these demon-like creatures. So these, creature, these creatures, obviously not so nice. Because the little people live there, the mountains are sacred to the crow. The little people are said to be no more than 18 inches high. Crow folklore differs slightly from that of other tribes in describing the little people of the prior mountains as having large, nearly round bellies, incredibly strong but short arms and legs, and little or no neck. In the story of Lost Boy, or Burnt Face, the crow told of a little person who killed a full-grown bull elk and carried it off just by tossing the elk's head over its shoulder. The crow expression, strong as a dwarf, references the incredible strength of these little people. However, they are incredibly fierce warriors, feed primarily on meat, and have many sharp canine-like teeth in their mouths. Nearby tribes told stories of the little people tearing the hearts out of their enemies' horses, stories which may have helped keep these tribes from making war on the crow. Each year, the crow made an offering to the little people at Medicine Rocks, also known as Castle Rocks, where they believed some little people lived. The Prior Mountains little people were also known for stealing children, food, medicine, and tobacco. That certainly seems to be another thing that is very common in both the North American and, at the very least, European and, I believe, African stories of these little creatures as well. The crow also believed that the little people created stone arrowheads, for the crow themselves only knew how to make bone arrowheads. Anyone who tried to play a trick on the little people would incur their wrath, which usually destroyed him and his entire family. The little people, sometimes referred to as spirit dwarves, were also said to be able to confer blessings or spiritual insight to certain individuals. Generally speaking, the crow would refuse to enter the prior mountains due to their belief in the little people. However, on occasion, a lone crow would travel to the medicine rocks and fast, where one of the little people might manifest as a lone animal to teach the seeker these insights. The crow tell of two ways to pass through the mountains without being harmed by the little people, however. Both involved offerings. I'm just going to skim down here a little bit because I see that there is a story of an encounter here and I would like to read this. I will link all of these articles in the description box in case you want to go back and read all of them, but I'm just trying to get right down to the, the account and I may not read the whole thing, but I would like to at least get the gist of it. One of the most famous crow leaders to encounter the little people was the legendary crow chief Plenty Koo. Uh, when he was nine years old, Plenty Koo, older Plenty Koo's older brother, who was a great warrior and quite handsome, and whom Plenty Koo loved deeply, was killed by raiding Lakotas. Although the tribe was preparing to move out, Plenty Koo fasted for four days, used the sweat lodge, rubbed his body with sage and cedar to remove any smell, and then went into the nearby hills where he had a vision. In his vision, the chief of the little people took him into a spirit world lodge where Plenty Koo saw representation of nature, the wind, the stars, the thunder, the moon, bad storms, etc. Kind of reminds me of the elementals. The dwarf chief demanded that Plenty Koo count Koo, but since Plenty Koo was just nine years of age, he knew that he had no great deeds to count. Nonetheless, the chief of the little people recounted two great deeds to the spirits gathered in the lodge and said that Plenty Koo 
would not only accomplish these deeds, but many others as well. He also prophesied that Plenty Coup would become chief of his people if he used his wits, and then advised Plenty Coup to develop his willpower so that he could lead his people. So, he had a vision of these little people. It sounds, the way that it describes them when it comes to the representations of nature sounds very much like the elementals. And the fact that he saw them in a vision, it, it reminds me of, um, in the New Age religion, many people talk about astral projection. And I actually have a book called the, I think it's called The Second Coming of the New Age. And I'll leave a link for that in the description box if you're interested. But it is actually talking about how the authors are coming out of the New Age religion. But they were saying about how some of these drugs that they took, like LSD and other things, or some of the astral projections that they were doing, they believe were taking them into other dimensions where they were able to see some sorts of demonic beings. And so him having this vision and being taken into a spirit world lodge it reminds me very much of these astral or these out of body experiences let's i think that's a better word an out of body experience and so that's why i do think that it's possible that some of these creatures could be living either in other dimensions or in in both dimensions you know that they're kind of able to go from one to the other but anyway, that's just my thoughts on the little people of North America. I hope that you enjoyed this. I always find stuff like this super interesting. And I really do like to think about where these things come from. Because, you know, the world that God created, I don't think we even know a quarter of everything there is to know about out there. And you know what? He is amazing. And so so is the world that, that he's placed here. Anyway, that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my YouTube membership page, I will leave a link in the description box for that, or you can just click on it on my YouTube uh, page there. And I hope you have a great day.